we would go into Nick's studios at Britannia Row and just jam about. With the release of Pink Floyd The Later Years, a massive new box set from one of the greatest bands the world has ever seen, comes your chance to hear the real story of this legendary time. I'm David Gilmour, and welcome to The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. Throughout this series, we'll delve into four key elements of Pink Floyd's creative output from 1987 to today. I remember sitting at the piano, coming up with the music, knowing we were onto a killer. The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. We were in the middle of a major lawsuit, and between every little bit I was doing, I was on the phone to lawyers. That stuff was just eating away at me, us, and our time. This is episode one, The Studio. Hello, David. Hi, Matt. <laughs> good morning to you. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good. Pretty good. The story probably starts late 85, early 86. When you were writing songs at that point, can you remember thinking, this is a Floyd song, this should be a Floyd song? I don't think that's ever a delineation that you make, or that certainly that I would make. I just start writing and hoping that things will progress into something. And I had been working for some time in the studio on a number of songs, but what was then going to happen was in the air for a long time while Roger decided whether he was going to fuck off into the ether or not and, and what we would then do. So what was the mindset of you as individuals then, you and Richard and well, Rick you know, time. Rick at that time had been um, bunged out during the war. So it was basically, at that time, it was me and Nick, and we talked about it and said we wanted to continue. During that summer, I was, summer of 86, I guess it was, I was thinking about it, putting together the bits of music that I had, thinking, how am I going to go about doing this? During that summer, I went on holiday to the same place as Rick was, and I did speak to him there and asked him about if he fancied coming in and doing some work on, on this project, which he was quite keen on the idea of. But I needed a person that I could count on, so I got Bob Ezrin back in, who'd worked on The Wall and on a previous solo album. Bob's a very good driving force. He's very honest with his opinions, you might say. <laughs> you could say brutally honest with his opinions. Um, so he's not going to let you get away with anything that isn't uh, up to the standard that you want of yourself. Uh, but, you know, it was, um, it was an alarming time. It's quite a big thing to, to carry on doing something like this, something like this, specifically Pink Floyd, with Roger having gone. You know, a big, big part of it, obviously. And a major talent. and. A, our primary lyricist, so it was difficult. And you kind of reached out to other people to start collaboratively thinking about yeah. that element, replacing that element, or yeah. bringing in new words. Yes, we did that. We had um, Anthony Moore, who I knew from somewhere or other, God knows what, but uh, was a lyricist, and I invited him to come and help and see if he would have any good ideas, and Bob thought of one or two other people some of whom were too similar to me in some ways. What do you mean? Valuable. Well, I suppose you could say the Roger and me thing is I would think of myself, and some people might agree, that I'm more of a melodic type of person and Roger is more of a aggressive wordsmith and, you know, there are different sides of us that came together to create the, the thing that we became. You don't want to exactly try to replicate any of that. That's something with a harder edge to it than, than I tend to have seemed to be a good idea to be, to be looking at. I have always been here. Were there many people who tried to sort of come into it with existing Pink Floydian tropes? It's like, oh, I've got this lyric about time and destiny. It's like, oh, we've kind of done that. <laughs> it, it, no, it didn't work that way. I mean, we, I met people and 
you know, had dinner with a couple of people and chatted and stuff. And basically, if I thought it was going to work, we might continue. But in fact, in the end, it was basically Anthony doing most of the lyrics for three songs and myself trying to um, crack on with it. Because the image of these these gents gently bobbing mm. about mm. in yeah. the Astoria mm. recording, this very sort of, it gives the image of it being a very tranquil experience and just leisurely taking your time and you're shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe it for a second. I mean, you know, not to dig up or cover too much ancient, horrible territory, but we were in the middle of a major lawsuit and between every little bit I was doing, I was on the phone to lawyers and uh, that, that stuff was just eating away at me, us, and our time. In the studio? Yeah, I mean, oh, it, it, was, um, it was a nightmare. Trying to, um, you know, if the image of it being a bucolic, beautiful scene of bobbing on a river, and uh, that was the intention that was intended, but uh, it wasn't the reality of the recording sessions. Of course, later, because Bob lived in Los Angeles and insisted that we do some of it in England and some of it, I insisted we do some of it in England, he insisted we do some of it in, in LA. When we moved to LA, there was um, um, some relief from that because office hours in England and office, office hours in LA aren't the same. So by the time uh, we started work in LA, all legal firms were closed in London, so it made things a little bit easier. Um, so this was, even before it was decided, what it was going to be called. This was the no obligations record. There was no deadline in theory. There was no kind of label asking for this record. That gives you a certain amount of freedom. That has to be a positive thing. Um, I don't remember thinking about that or, or not. I knew that um, if we put together a record, the label would probably take it as long as it was OK. <laughs> but I definitely wanted to continue with my sort of chosen career that I'd worked so many years on, and, and Nick did too, and um, so we started working and planning and trying things out. And by Christmas, having started, I guess it must have been in late September, by Christmas we were feeling quite optimistic. We had some nice pieces of music and some beginnings of some good lyrics, and we ploughed on through the early part of the next year. I remember the moment a whole lyric for Sorrow came to me like magic from nowhere. And I sat down and just basically wrote down five verses of a song, which I had no music for, and I've never done it that way round before. It's always been music first, but uh, with Sorrow, the, the, the words came first, and then I wrote music to fit it and went in and demoed it and put it all together in the studio. That, for me, was the moment when I thought we were all in the clear. It was the direction we wanted to be going, and it was a good song. It gave context to the other songs, and um, it made me have confidence in where we were going. Because, of course, you know, the moment the word gets out there will be a new Pink Floyd album. The expectations upon that are huge, yeah. inescapable, regardless yeah. of any history that had gone up to that point mm. with anyone. The expectations are enormous. Is it possible, especially at that moment with that album, was it mm. possible to set that aside mm. or was it on your shoulder somewhat? It's, you know, it's really not something that I think about. People's expectations of what it's going to be are not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about making a record for me. I'm sure subconsciously there are decisions that you make when making a Pink Floyd record that differ slightly to the ones that you might make when making a solo record, but they're not decisions that are conscious 
or that I think about. And of course, still with, with Bob there, cracking the whip, trying to make sure that we moved and we, we moved in a good direction and uh, not allowing anything to slip by. You know, he's a guy I learned a lot from. So this is kind of connected to the box set, the new version of Momentary Lapse of Reason. What can you tell me about the kind of creative dynamic between uh, Rick and Nick and you at that point when you were working on this record? It's a difficult thing to discuss. It's a painful thing for all of them to discuss because um, Roger's departure had damaged people because I talked about it at the time, but it's very tricky to... Anyway. We got to Los Angeles, and, uh, and I think pretty much up to that moment we had um, used um, click tracks and drum machines and so on and so forth, and we started in Los Angeles by uh, adding drums to these tracks, and it all was really, really coming together. We had the good songs, we had um, Learning to Fly on the Turning Away, Sorrow. These were, for me, the sort of the big moments, I suppose you could say. Um, and it, uh, yeah, sorry, it's just, some of this stuff is very awkward to uh, steer around and... That must have been very, very difficult mm. to navigate. It was, I mean, and, you know, Rick was coming in and working sometimes, and Nick was there, you know, but um, there were difficulties. The thing about the time was that uh, in the 80s, there was a mass of new technology, new keyboards, synthesizers, all this stuff. And we were keen to make a record that was of its time. We embraced a lot of this new technology with massive enthusiasm. And of course, that is a fashion, and fashions go out of fashion. And I. I think in the in the years after a momentary lapse of reason, uh, there were moments when I thought that we hadn't followed the the timeless template that I think perhaps we should have done at the time, and so I think we wanted to go back, temper down some of those things, replace one or two rather jangly keyboards with rather nicer Hammond organ and. So that's what we've been doing in the recent past. Um, we got Nick to come and play the drums on every track. We've found old takes of Rick playing Hammond organ and other things, which for some reason are very hard to fathom we didn't use at the time. But you know, you, you have a quite clear idea of what you're aiming at and the mixing that you want to do and how you want the whole thing to sound. And later you realize, fuck, it was the 80s. <laughs> Andy Jackson has been a sound engineer with Pink Floyd since 1981. Lately, he's been busy remixing and remastering A Momentary Lapse of Reason for the later years box set, but he can still remember the original recording sessions. We didn't quite know what we were going to do. David had just recently bought the Astoria Studios where we are now, and it was just, come down, we're going to try some stuff out. Bob Ezrin had come in with with some idea that, that what we should do is try to do something that was very, very cutting edge and current. That's something that, that sounds very good, but of course what it means is it becomes very time stamped. Particularly because with Roger's input and impetus missing, there was a vacuum to fill in. In some ways, that idea filled that vacuum. So we were presented with all this technology and these new, uh, new toys, effectively, that we could play with. So for the first time, computer technology had come in and we could utilise that to program some of the music so that effectively you had robotic people playing. And th this was something that was enormously appealing because it gives you control over things. So you get this massive control of being able to say, I want this to happen. I want 
an instrument that I can imagine in my head to play this piece of music, and you can you can create that. So this this becomes a very seductive musical drug, if you like, and we very much followed that path. And, and it, it was with the context, it maybe if not if the idea that we were having to invent a new way of working because the old way was no longer there. At the time, it, it was it did achieve. The brief that we set out was just to make it sound very now, but now became then, and then became a long time ago. And it, and in retrospect, it became very time-stamped, and and it sounds like a product of when it was made. When the childlike view of the world went, nothing replaced it. Well, here we are on a on a story of the boat, and it is. It's a fantastic place to work. I mean, normally in a studio, you're locked in a concrete box, and this is a. This is extraordinary as a, as a location, but it's a boat, <laughs> and it moves, and noises come in, and there's ducks and solo the vocal tracks on that album. There's birds on it and things like that. I mean, it's not it's not a silent environment. The album opens with the sound of of rowing. It's unsurprising that that idea came into our heads really, and I just jerry rigged a couple of mics and a little recorder, and you know somebody went out and rowed a boat down the river. So we actually made that. It is actually our boat, our river kind of thing. Yeah, this very much became part of the fabric, and that's done ever since. I mean, you know, we, here we are still. I mean, it's a it's a fabulous working environment. The sound, the, all the noises at the beginning of. Uh, one slip. That was Albert. That was the burglar alarm system here. We would deliberately set it off by keying in the wrong code over and over and over again. The dispute with Roger was still very much ongoing at that point. When I say Roger had effectively left the band, I'm applying a retrospective analysis to that, and that was not necessarily legally what it was at the time. It was much. Wrangling about what exactly the situation was, and Roger felt, you know, not least of all legally, that the notion that the band could carry on without him was wrong. I mean, they, they couldn't, and it wasn't resolved. There was always the spectre hanging over this project that they may not be able to use the name. Day to day when you're working, it's not necessarily there, but then it would flare up because something would happen. Some papers would arrive on someone's desk and, and it would all come back into focus again. It becomes a burden that you've got to carry. So as well as David at that time being the primary musical force of, of carrying all of that on his shoulders, he was having to carry all the, the legal difficulties as well on these shoulders as well. So it was just, it just adds to the burden and, and you know, makes the whole thing stressful. And of course they play into it, inevitably they play into each other. Is it fair to say, looking back, that a momentary lapse of reasons, success or failure, would have dictated if Floyd had a future. Um, God, that's a. I don't think so. I don't think that would have altered anything. But I, it was never something I thought about. Um, I thought that we were going to make an album and that we were going to do a tour, and maybe after that we would reassess. The album for me went very, very well. Um, the lawsuits were tricky, but you know, we put um, some first shows tickets on sale in about April or May of 87, I think, um, the, at Big Stadium in Toronto, and I think three nights sold out in about four hours or something. So we thought if things are moving in the right direction. It's looking good. So um, I, I, I guess I never had to confront your question, but I'm a pretty tough and stubborn and determined person, and um, I suspect I'd have found a way to keep it going.
Let's look at the division bell, which came out in 94. What was your mindset going into those sessions? Was there a, that sense of confidence, but a sense of, as you said before, you know, we, we found this, we found how this is going to work, we found a direction that works for us and works for the creative push and pull of three of us. Rick and Nick were both, you know, on the, on the 1987, 88, 89 endless tour, were playing their socks off. They were fantastic. And so we thought, I guess it was in January 93, we would go into Nick's studios at Britannia Row, just the three of us. And that started the whole ball rolling. We didn't use, in the end, that much of what we got to at that point. And a lot of that resurfaced on the Endless River later. But it, it got us moving. We then moved to Astoria, the boat, and started working on songs in the way that you do. When certain individuals play together, something happens. It's not some sort of cosmic, mystical thing that descends from heaven. There's just the way that people play that works together, that's yeah. sympathetic to each other. Yeah. And you guys have always had that. Yeah. And, and that was what was reconfirmed when we went into the Rit Row Studios and, and played together. And that gave us a, a big boost in allowing ourselves to go back to things that we'd done years and years before. Through our time together, the, the process became more one person writing a song, turning up with it, and everyone working out how to fit what they do and learn parts for that song. But the process of, of the jamming at Brit Row allowed us to think that things could grow from a more organic start. And it was really enjoyable and really, if you have moments of doubts about uh, what people are doing and how they're doing it, um, that was all slipped by the wayside. I was so glad to have Rick there with his ideas and playing the way he did and, and Nick being, you know, the perfect drama for Pink Floyd. I mean, it felt so right on those sessions. Division Belt was an entirely different experience here. It, it was almost bore no relationship apart from it was the same people involved. They had spent a week jamming in Britannia Row Studios, but effectively using it like a rehearsal room and just had a live tape running and just to be able to just get ideas down. And we started off just by sifting through those ideas and saying, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. I like that. And, and categorizing them. Again, Bob came up with a system which was A's, B, A's, B's and C's, acoustic, blues and cosmic. And we just, so that, just so we could label things, you know, that's acoustic one, that's blues one, acoustic three, you know, and, and then we had a big wall chart and we would log, it's like, this is in E and is it 87 BPM? And we could say, oh, that one's in E, it's the same, you know, so what happens if you put those two together and, and gradually brought the songs into formation. It's like, okay, well, that bit and that bit, well, that doesn't work. What about if we do, if we need a new bit there? And so it became a much more organic process of, of, of creating the material. That record has th those guys playing together as, it, as its spine. Beyond the horizon of the place we lived when we were young In a world of magnets and miracles Our thoughts trade constantly and without boundary The ringing of the division bell had begun You know, one of the things that had changed, of course, in my life was that I had met my uh, later-to-be wife, Polly Sampson. She became quite a large part of it, not just a lyricist, I have to say. You know, she became a producer as well. You know, we'd work all day on the boat, and I would go back home, and we'd play the things 
that we were working on, and she would be digging for what the point of these things was, and that you should be pushing it towards its main point. And she became invaluable to me. You know, we'd spend the however many eight or nine hours on the boat, and then there'd be another two or three hours at home afterwards, uh, with me trotting off back to the studio the next day with um, with ideas for how we could make things work better. And she, of course, wanted me to write lyrics and bullied me by asking me questions about my childhood and how did this happen, you should write about this. Um, and of course, I then persuaded her to take part in them when, and um, she, she's just very, very good at it and uh, helped me enormously and became the primary lyricist on, on that album. Was High Hopes her kind of door into that now? Well, I can't remember quite the moment when the High Hopes thing came up. I remember sitting at the piano in my house and coming up with the music for it and knowing that we were onto a killer with that song. And we went into the studio probably the next day. And again, I put all the parts down myself, making a, a demo of the backing track, for High Hopes. And then, then we decided, Polly and I, to go away for a few days and nail the lyrics. And she was dragging things out of me and adding to them. And it was a great collaboration. She came up with lots of very good lines and pulled the lines that I'd spoken about this and that and said, let's just use that there, and it was fantastic. Encumbered forever by desire and ambition There's a hunger still unsatisfied Still stray to the horizon Go down this road we've been so many times The grass was green The light was bright Some elements, some visuals or musical words have an inherent kind of Pink mm. Floydness about them and that yeah. song, it inhibits that world. Yeah. It's... I don't know. It's, it's mm. that it's partially nostalgic, but it's also partially. Mm. It's got forward momentum. Yeah. It's got romance. It's got skepticism. Mm. It's got all these elements in it. It just. Yes. It's a very. Mm. It encapsulates your world very well. Well, it's song. you know there's the there's the um, there's the hometown and the home life and the departure from that which you know Roger had departed from our pop group and. That was another departure, and um, you know Polly's line about the division bell, the ringing of the division bell had begun, which uh, is so apposite for the change from early life to adult life and for all these other things. That was such a moment of, of joy for me, getting that song and Polly pushing and writing those lyrics with me, turning it into what I think is an all-time great Floyd song and would have been at any time in our career, he said slightly defensively. <laughs> well, on a similar subject, I can't help but find the album title very evocative mm. at the moment. Yeah. The, it's parliamentary meaning, you know, the undeniable mm. visions in society, regardless of mm. what side of the fence you may mm sit on and the record's themes about mm. communication. Mm. Well, Polly just came up with the phrase, I think, if my memory serves me well, and we, we looked it up to see exactly what it meant and, you know, the division of the yeas and nays in, in, in Parliament. Later on, when we were hunting for a title for the album, we talked to Douglas Adams about it, who's our friend. He went through the lyrics and he picked on that in the middle of that song said, there you are, there's your title. You should use that. Cause the things you say 
And the things you do surround me While you were hanging yourself on someone else's words Dying to believe in what you heard I was staring straight into the shadows the process that you used to pick the final songs has kind of passed into Floyd legend, the kind of voting process as to who picked, how you came up with the final songs that would make the track listing, make the running order. How true is the, is the voting system story? Um, well, the voting system <laughs> wasn't about the final songs okay. on the album. It was about all the pieces of music that we had done at Britannia Row. I think, if my memory serves me well. And we gave them all, it wasn't voting a yay or a nay, I think we gave them points out of 10, or points out of something, to all these different little morsels of music of us playing together. Because in Britannia Row, we didn't have um, a full-time engineer recording everything we did. We had a DAT machine on a stool next to me the mics in the room were going through the desk and going back to this DAT machine. I was pressing record and play on the DAT machine whenever I felt something was going on that I wanted to have to remind myself of. So we had hundreds of little morsels of music, many of them missing the beginning because we'd start doing something and I'd press the button, many of them not really ending, you know. So the, the, the voting system or the point scoring system, I think was all about those pieces of music and which ones we should continue with. I mean, there were a lot of songs that just came up as songs from me initially. I a great day for freedom, Polly's lovely lyrics about her the ups and downs of the conflicts in Eastern Europe at the time. Very, very complex subject. But um, uh, again, a piece of music that I had written at home and that I loved and it was hard to find a way to get to. Quite a few of the songs were songs that were written or completed after those sessions at Britannia Row. Uh, but a lot of the joining pieces, introductory stuff, were all things that came out of those sessions at, uh, at, at Brit Row. The voting system was, was how we decided on which ones we would uh, work on, I think. Which does bring us on to the final record. It brings us on to the Endless River, which came out in 2014. That's a big gap between records. <laughs> Well, you know, we had... Um, to put it crudely. As we, you know, have been discussing those songs, those t tunes, those bits of music that we did at Brit Row, which we then worked on again and developed on the boat. But a lot of the stuff wasn't used. And Andy Jackson put together a compilation of the bits that he liked particularly around the time that we finished that, that album, The Division Bell. Um, and he called it The Big Spliff. I don't know what he meant. You know, if you listen to it, you thought, there are lovely pieces of playing on here, there are lovely bits of music that we didn't get to complete or for one reason or other weren't used. So we did think at some point we should try and go through all that music again, collate it all and see what we had and think about making a new record based on all that music with Rick playing on it and all of us playing on it um, after his uh, death. It all came out of that sort of basic idea by, by Andy. I don't think if Andy had put together his version of the Big Spliff, we'd have ever got to making uh, The Endless River. When we were doing Division Bell, there was a bit of me thought, rather than saying we should take this bit and play it for 16 bars and say that's a verse and then take this bit and play it 16 bars and say that's a chorus. How about we play it for four minutes? You know, and I suppose I wanted to make echoes or something like that. Again, the second part where it just takes forever. 
There was a bit of me wanted to say, why don't we do that? Why don't we do something like that? Rather than do something which is a five minute song. And I thought, we've, you know, we've got stuff here in all these jams and things where you could do that. So I took it upon myself to take some of the tapes and I literally took stuff home and played around with it and, and made a, psych, you know, a psychedelic mashup as a sort of, not that, here, we should play this, but it's like, this is the sort of thing we could do. I'm not saying do this one, I'm just saying, you know, here's a dish you could make out of these sort of ingredients. Why don't we think about something like this? And as a joke, I called it the big spliff for obvious reasons. Steve O'Rourke, the, the manager, said, we should put it out exactly like that and call it that. He, he thought it was spot on. And you know, they listened to it and thought, well, yeah, OK. And uh, at one point, the idea came about, I think it was Nick, saying, well, maybe we should make two records simultaneously here. We should make an album of songs and an album of extended psychedelic noodling. <laughs> that was, the, it got put away until such a time as the whole thing of, you know, no Rick anymore. So the idea of, it'd be nice to bring what's left of Rick out, you know, we've got this stuff left over playing. What can we do with it? It's got some just lovely moments of, of us all playing together. It's not as organized and designed and planned as us other Pink Floyd records have been, but it's, um, it's, it's lovely music on there. It's capturing a bit of those sort of two weeks that uh, we did in Brit Row, where it was just us jamming, finding out about each other and enjoying our own talents. We pitch and we fight And then you've got Louder Than Words. Louder Than Words. The, well, the most directly, obviously, personal Pink Floyd song. The only Pink Floyd song about Pink Floyd. Yeah. How was it? From Polly's view. Yeah. Po Polly's point of view, yes. How was it singing that? Fantastic. I, I loved singing it. I love that song. It's, I've got nothing against the truth. You've been listening to The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. Coming up in episode two, we peer behind the curtain of the record-breaking live shows brought together for the first time on the Later Years box set. The trouble with being in the band and having to do the singing and the playing is that you can't be out there in the audience at the same time seeing what's going on and trying to see what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and what should be being done better. Don't forget to hit subscribe for the next episode of The Lost Art of Conversation wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on the new Pink Floyd The Later Years box set, to pre-order, order, or find out more about what's in this epic release, go to pinkfloyd.com now. <laughs>